Luke chapter 9. We'll begin in the beginning of the chapter with verse number 1. It says, uh, Then He called His twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. <clears throat> and He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And He said unto them, and this is our title this morning, Take nothing for your journey. Take nothing for your journey, neither staves, that, those are rods or staffs. Nor scrip, that is a wallet or a pouch for food. Neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you when you go out of the city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Take nothing for your journey. This uh, same account is listed in two of the other Gospels, so I want to read those quickly. They read slightly differently. Mark chapter 6 and verse number 8. I just want to focus in on the, the, the verse that I really want to emphasize this morning. If we read in Mark 6 and verse number... Um, well, verse 7 shows us he, he called the twelve and he began to send them forth by two and two. Sends them forth two at a time just as he did the seventy. And he commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey. In verse 8, save a staff only. And that reads a little differently than the other one. The other one said, don't take any staffs. But I will say it was plural in the other verse. Don't take a staff. Uh, or you can take a staff, singular only. No script, no bread, no money in their purse. But be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. And then finally in Matthew chapter 10... We have this account one more time. Verse number 9. Again, 5 says he, the 12 he sent forth. These are the 12. Verse 9 says, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes. It's not telling them to take shoes at all. The other verse that we just read said, Take your sandals with you. But uh, neither shoes nor yet staves or staffs, rods, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Uh, so the point is not that they are to you know, not take a staff or take any shoes, but the point is that they are, aren't, aren't to take anything extra, right? Not to prepare further for the unknown. Uh, you ever packed your bags to go somewhere and when you come back home, you're like, man, I put three times more than I needed in my bags, right? I could have done away with two of those suitcases. <laughs> I'm not going to comment that somebody was just looking at his wife. I'm not even going there. I'm going to be good right now and not address that. But we will talk later, brother. Uh, <laughs> but, but so the point is, go as they are, right? Don't gather extra for preparation in case one staff breaks or one pair of shoes fails or one coat fails to be sufficient. Don't prepare for the unknown. Just go trusting that I'll take care of you. Right? You see that? So some people would suggest that these verses are a pattern for our lives each and every day. They are to be obeyed daily. There's no need to prepare. Not only is there no need, it's sinful based on a text like this to prepare. After all, doesn't the Lord tell us to take no thought for your life? Remember that? No, what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall wear. That's Matthew 6.31. Uh, Matthew 6.34 says, take no thought for tomorrow. Look at Luke 12, uh, same passage where he's, Jesus is teaching on that. In Luke 12 and verse number 22, Jesus says that, uh, He said unto His disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. He tells them that there. And this comes right on the heels of a man that put much emphasis on preparation for the future. This comes right on the heels of the parable of the rich man whose fields brought in plentifully and we know what he did. He tore down his barns and he bought bigger barns and he said, man, I am prepared for the future. I'm set. And what did Jesus say? You're a fool. You're never going to get to enjoy any of those things. You're preparing for a future that's not going to be there. This night your soul 
is required of you. He says in verse 20, And whose, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So on the heels of speaking of this man that prepared much foolishly, Jesus says, then don't take any thought for your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall put on. Hmm. Interesting. So some would suggest that it means there's no preparation, no thought for the future, just living in the here and now. That's all we're supposed to do. Be wrong to do otherwise. But then there's also another train of thought that says, well, no, we have responsibility. And uh, uh, there's, it's the other end of the spectrum. They love to quote, God helps those that help themselves. And sometimes I've even heard them say, like the Bible says, God helps those that help themselves. Let me just clear that up for you. It's not in the Bible. It's not a Bible verse. They cling hard to verses that they come across to justify their way of think, thinking. Proverbs 10.4 says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. That's Bible, right? And so they will highlight verses like that. Maybe they'll take you to the ant. Let's go to the ant, thou sluggard, right? Let's go to the ant in Proverbs chapter number 6, and let's consider the ant. And so they, they say, what about Proverbs 6? You know, there's our, there's our example. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, that's Proverbs 6, 7, verse 8 says, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. What's the point? She's prepared, right? She's prepared for what's coming in the future. She stores up this grain. Um... The treasury of scriptural knowledge pointed out that, they, that, 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 that ants break off the end of the seed that germinates so that it won't germinate while they're storing it up. I'd never heard that. That's pretty wise, huh? How'd she know to do that? God put it in her, right? And I, I don't know how these people that study nature like this don't see God everywhere, right? But the point is she prepares, right? She does prepare. The cold weather's coming, and so in the harvest, I'm going to store up so that I'm ready and so that we have grain to make it all the way through to the end. She's not literally reasoning and thinking that out. God just put it in her. And then Solomon writes, you need to learn from that. And so they exalt passages like that. In her diligence and her industry, she stores up so that she's sustained in the future. That's an example for us. And so the lazy man is warned for not preparing because this is what happens to the lazy man according to Proverbs 20 and verse 4. Let's look at that. Proverbs 20 and verse 4 says this, The sluggard will not plow by reason of the coal. And so guess what's going to happen to him come harvest time? <laughs> He's not going to have anything, right? Why? Because he didn't prepare for harvest time, right? By plowing right now. It's too cold. It's too uncomfortable. I'll wait on that later. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. So which is correct? I saw one brother mouth it. Both. I'll add to that, and neither. It depends on how you observe it. That's what I want to consider this morning. Because maybe I'm the only one that's dealt with this, but I'll tell you some of my personal struggles. Sometimes I get confused about, well, am I preparing and I shouldn't prepare? Or then sometimes on the, I'm on the other end of that spectrum and it's like, I should have prepared, right? I should have been ready for this, Lord. Which one's right? Both and sometimes neither. All of those verses that we read are Scripture, right? I didn't read anything that wasn't the Word of God, except I highlighted, and I hope none of you will ever say that God helps those that help themselves in Scripture. 
Not exactly like that, right? There's some truth to that, but again, you've got to understand the context of that. You've got, to understand, you've got to be able to explain that. Don't just tell me that. Tell me what you mean by that. Because I can tell you the people that I've normally heard quote that to me don't really have any clue what the Scripture really teaches. All of those verses we read are in Scripture, but compared to the two extremes, our calling is really somewhere in the middle. And don't we find that usually to be the case? Don't we find that there are always extremes, right, of any of God's truth and we're called to be somewhere in the middle? Um, as I was sitting up here praying about this this morning, before we started singing, Shannon's playing over there, trust and obey. obey. Right? Right? I was like, that could be my message title this morning. Brother Jeff, and then Brother Jeff gets up here, and he, before he gets up here, he says, I want to go to Psalm 37. And I immediately knew what Psalm that was, and I was like, that could be my text this morning. <laughs> and listen to what he read us in, in Psalm 37 in verse number 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord. But that's not all it says. There's more to that verse, right? Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. And I don't think Brother Jeff made it to this verse, but I confess I was reading a little ahead. <laughs> verse 34 says this, Wait on the Lord, again it doesn't stop there, and keep His way. Trust and do. Trust and obey, right? And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. So, let's consider those verses that we have already read this morning. And see if we can shed some light on this. And maybe it will help you when you find yourself in that conundrum. I love to throw words out like that that I don't really know the proper definition of it. But I just think it fits. You can look up conundrum. I think it's a difficult situation, right? It just popped in my head. I had to say it. Um, Luke chapter 10. All right, we read in Luke number 9, and I want to say this about our text in Luke number 9. I want to point out, first of all, that in our main text, that it was part of a direct command by the Lord to 12 men that He had called for a specific task. And I think that's important. For these men to have taken any of those things that the Lord said don't take, it would have been sinful. It would have been in direct disobedience to the command of God. He had a specific task that He had called them to, similar to the specific task that He has for the 70 in the next chapter in Luke. Our text was in Luke 9. In Luke 10, He says something very similarly. Uh, the Lord appointed 70 also. And sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. But I don't want you to prepare for those wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes. And he says here, and salute no man by the way. In other words, I've got a specific task and I want, you, there's, I want you to have a sense of urgency. There needs to be diligence in doing that which I'm commanding you to do. A specific call. A specific task. This doesn't mean that when we pass someone in the store now, we can't stop and chat with them for a little bit because Jesus said, salute no man along the way. He didn't want them stopping because you have a specific responsibility. And what was that responsibility? I want you to go and I want you to preach the truth in all these cities that I'm about to go to. You see that was their specific task? Verse number one. Let me do this one time, Brother Bob, so we can have that on the, the video. All right, there. We got it. That's what always shows up online. I don't know what it's, We're like this or like this. And so a specific task. Uh, he, he calls them for a specific purpose. They had the specific responsibility of preceding him to the cities that he intended to go. And so our Lord here says to them the same thing. I don't want you carrying anything extra, right? Just go and trust. Trust and obey, right? Don't make any further preparation in this text. 
But I want you to go now in the same gospel and listen to what the Lord says to the disciples in Luke 22. All right? Look, jump over to Luke 22. In Luke 22, in verse number 35, he explains to them why he told them not to take anything extra at that time. He tells them the purpose of that command. And like I said, it would have been wrong for them to take something extra. It would have been wrong for them to prepare for the unknowns in that circumstance. Because this is what the Lord was teaching them in verse 35 when He said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and, and shoes, lack ye anything. And they said, what? Nothing. Nothing. In other words, that was a faith experience for you, right? That was an issue of faith for you at that time because I wanted you to understand those things aren't what takes care of you. I'm the one who takes care of you. Amen. And you know what I can do? I can take care of you supernaturally through those means, and I can take care of you through natural means. But I want you to understand this. I'm the one that takes care of you. Right? Why do you have no faith? He asked the disciples. Why are you concerned about these things? Uh, you know, when they asked the question, is it, did He say that because we didn't bring any bread? Didn't I just feed 5,000 people? Right. Are you learning from these past experiences to trust Me? Are you learning that, yes, you go to that job every day to provide for your family, but the job's not who provides for your family. It's me, God says. Amen. And so that's the lesson that I wanted you to learn. And then he says this in verse 36. But now, he that hath a purse, you know what? Take it. And likewise... His script. Two things that he mentioned over in the previous passage. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. My point is this. The instruction was different this time than it was over here. It's always critical that we, when we read what we read, we read it in the context of how it's presented. It doesn't mean that it's always a sin to prepare for what might be in the future, but it was a sin for them at that time to prepare in that fashion. Brother Jeff mentioned this morning uh, uh, the manna, right? And Brother Jeff, you talked about it. What happened if they took more manna than they were supposed to take? If they tried to store some up in case they were you know, hungry the next day, what would happen? It would spoil, right? That's true every day except for Friday. You see what I'm saying? Friday, they were supposed to prepare for tomorrow, right? On the other days, take what's necessary for today. And like you said, trust the Lord for your daily bread. But on Friday, you better take enough for Saturday too, right? Because the Sabbath day, I don't want you collecting anything. So you see my point? In one instance, it would have been wrong for them to take up more. In the other instance, it would have been, they were going to be hungry if they didn't take up some extra, right? There's more to this. It's not, it's cut and dry. We always want it to be cut and dry, right? We always want, we want it to be just like this. You know why? Because we want to abandon faith. We would much rather have a list of do's and don'ts than say, I'm going to walk by faith with my God. And I'm going to take every circumstance and I'm going to walk with Him in that circumstance and I'm going to trust that He's going to guide me in that. Didn't we just read the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord? I wish I'd had that verse when I was teaching on the twofold cord because the next verse says that if he falls, the Lord shall uphold him. And you that heard the twofold cord message know how appropriate that is. Joseph, I want you to store up not for the next day, I want you to store up for seven years, right? So the whole world will be fed the next seven years. Sometimes it's proper and appropriate to prepare. Other times it's proper and appropriate to just rest and trust the Lord's going to take care of it. Okay? I hope maybe this will help you. Maybe you won't find yourself in that conundrum next time. The point is that God takes care of you, period. Whether you have extra, whether you have lack, the Lord provides through whatever means He sees fit. Trust Him. Trust and obey. Your job is just to obey. We, we quoted uh, some texts. I think we actually read it. Uh, go to Luke 12. Luke 12. And maybe, maybe this will help you in the context of this chapter. 
Consider the phrase, take no thought. We mentioned that, right? Take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, what you shall wear, what you shall put on, right? That uh, phrase is used, is used twice in that fashion. The Greek word is actually used, I think, four times in this text. We're going to see it a little bit. Um, but I'll show you where it's used exactly like that. Take no thought. In Luke 12, verse number 11. And when they bring you into the synagogues and the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. So take no thought. And there are some preachers that, that would take that and say, well, then I'm not going to prepare for my message each week. I'm just going to come up here and I'm going to open my Bible and whatever God gives me in that moment. I feel sorry for those people yeah. that have to sit under that. That's not what this verse is talking about. Look at, uh, look at verse number 22. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat. The body is more than raiment. And now if you look through this text here, beginning in verse number, 44, uh, verse number 4 all the way down through verse number 34, you're going to see that he's dealing with two topics in these verses. You're going to see him deal with fear. Listen to verse 4. I say unto you, my friends, don't be afraid of them that kill the body. Uh, verse 5, I'll tell you who you should be afraid of. Fear him which has power to kill the body and cast it into hell. Fear ye him. Uh, he begins to, to, to talk about that fear. You know, uh, five sparrows are sold for this, and God doesn't forget them, but even the very hairs of your head are numbered. And so, children, you need to understand that you're of far more value than sparrows are. So he deals with fears in this text, and he also deals with covetousness in this text. And we read the, about the rich man, and the, his heart was set on material things, and his desires for those things, and he stored those things up so that he could take his ease. And I, and I would actually add that in that covetousness, even, even that uh, fear plays a big part in that as well. But he's dealing with these two topics as you go down through here, and he, and he talks about these things, about not being fearful, and he also talks about having your heart set on material things. Don't be like that either. He deals with both of these thoughts as he uses this phrase, take no thought. So I want to help you out a little bit with this phrase, okay? We're going to come back here at some point, but uh, I want you to see this phrase, uh, take thought. The Greek word that's translated take thought when he says take no thought. Go to Philippians 4 6, a very familiar passage. Philippians 4 6. Philippians 4 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. You know where it is? You know where take no thought is? Be careful for nothing. Now that's not how we would use that word careful in our day and age. That's not typically what we're talking about. I mean, if, if, I, if my kid's going off somewhere and I say, be careful... Did I just sin against God? Did I just teach my child contrary to the Word of God that says be careful for nothing? Any of you have little ones and they, you know, they want to climb on everything and they're climbing up on something and you're like, be careful? What do you mean when you say that? What we mean when we say be careful is we mean be aware. Uh, uh, pay attention, right? Be cautious. Be, be, be conscious of the fact that th you could really get hurt doing this, right? Be aware of the danger in this circumstance. That's what we mean whenever we say be careful. But every other translation I looked at here in this text did not translate it be careful for nothing. How does it usually translate it? Be anxious for nothing. It's talking about being worried. It's talking about being anxious. That's what's being taught here. Be anxious for nothing, right? 
<clears throat> be anxious. doesn't mean don't have a care. It doesn't mean don't think about something before it come to pass. Don't realize that you might fall off that rock and hit your head, so be careful. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't prepare ahead of time. It doesn't mean that you should take no thought. In other words, that you shouldn't think about something as a possibility that, or something that might most likely come to pass in the future. It means don't worry about it. Don't be anxious about it. All right, let me give you a good verse to put it in perspective. It's got the same Greek word and it's got another Greek word. Both are translated care in this verse. 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. And I think it would be helpful to jot one or both of these passages down beside that phrase, take no thought, so we can understand what it means. 1 Peter 5. And verse number 7. Casting all your care upon Him. That word care there is the word take no thought. It's the word be careful for nothing. It means cast all your anxieties upon Him. Right? Cast all your worry upon Him. But that is not the same word that's used in the second half of this verse. For He careth for you. For He careth for you. In other words, He's interested. He's concerned about you. We were, we were talking about Brother Gary's lesson this morning back in the corner. There's, man, there's always good stuff over here. I'm just saying, you know. You might want to brush by and get a little bit of that because these brothers share some good things with you when you get up there kind of close to that. And they said, uh, one brother said, you know, that love of God, what, what amazes me with that is, is, is how personal that is. Is that God loves me specifically, Right? And so God says, cast your care, cast your anxieties upon me, you specifically, because I care for you. I know you by name. I don't just love you collectively. Thank God for God so loved the world for the co collectiveness of God's love, but thank God also for the particularness and the personalness of God's Word where I can say He loves me, specifically me. I am His and He is mine. Praise God for that. So God says, I don't want you worrying. I don't want you anxious. You, you give that over to me. That's not for you to carry. Because I want you to understand that not that I'm anxious for you, but I care for you. I'm interested in you. I'm concerned for you. See, the first type of care is bad. The second type of care is good. And we're called to exhibit that second type of care. That's not included over there where it says be careful for nothing, that we're not supposed to be interested and concerned about others, right? We're, we know we're called to do that. That word is better translated anxiety or worry. Be worried about nothing. Be anxious about nothing. Instead, cast that anxiousness upon the Lord because He's interested and concerned about you. And so now if you go back to Luke number 12... And we understand it's the same Greek word about being anxious and about being worried. Now those verses may take on a different meaning to you if you didn't understand that before. Now we, we get that he's, that he's saying in Luke 12 and verse number 11, you know, when they bring you before, these, uh, uh, be before the synagogues and the magistrates and the powers, don't be worried about what you're going to say. Don't be anxious about that, right? I'm not telling you don't think about it. I'm not saying just put it out of your mind and don't... You know, I'm going to, you know, I know they're going to talk to me about this, so, Lord, what's a verse there? It's okay. <clears throat> I'm coming up here to preach the Word of God to you. Lord, I've been chewing on this all week long, right? That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. I'm preparing because I know this day's coming, but don't be anxious about it. Don't be worried about it. You turn that over to the Lord and trust that God's going to provide, right? Same thing when you get down to verse number 22. <clears throat> and he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, don't be anxious for your life. Don't be worried about what, what are we going to eat? Are we going to have anything to eat tomorrow? Don't be worried about <clears throat> what's going to happen. You know, uh, some people are so overwhelmed with anxieties, they've got to be on medication because they can't handle what's coming tomorrow. God says, that's not you. You're supposed to be trusting in me. There's supposed to be peace and rest if you recognize that I'm the one that takes care of you. Amen. It's a little different, isn't it? And so, 
Don't worry about those things. Don't let them consume your mind. Isn't that what happens when we worry? When we're worried, it's on our mind all the time, right? That's the problem. Because what's supposed to be on our mind all the time? We're supposed to be seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. The Lord's supposed to be on our minds, right? We're supposed to be walking in a consciousness of Him. All We're supposed to be praying without ceasing. Worry works against that. Because worry takes over our mind. We're anxious about that situation and that consumes our thoughts. We're supposed to be thinking on things lovely and pure and of a good report and honest and true and praiseworthy things, right? Instead of seeking first the kingdom of God, if we're worrying, we're not seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We're not trusting and obeying. It says in verse 29, Seek not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor neither be ye of doubtful mind. Don't worry. That's what that phrase means. Don't be worried. Don't be consumed with anxiety. Don't be doubting that your God, that your Father loves you and He's going to care for you. Let me tell you what cast out fear. Perfect love. If I know that I'm an object of God's perfect love, that removes fear from my life. He's not going to forget. He's a good daddy. He's not going to forget about me. We left our kid in the garage one time. We were in the house for an hour. Where's Jonas? I think it was Jonas. He's strapped in the car seat, sleeping in the garage. I thought you got him out. No. You don't realize it until you go upstairs and you're checking in on him. He's not in his bed. Where is he? But God won't forget about us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, when mother and father forsake you, the Lord will take you up. By the way, it was David that said that. Brother Ed, the message Wednesday night, he talked about all the difficulties with David. And it, it, it maybe we're going to see this passage. I don't know. How, do we, how are we doing on time? Hey, we started late, okay? I'm just telling you guys. We started late. Um, but yeah, David, you think about David's life. He had a little tiny period where he had a little bit of rest, right? A little bit of peace. And that was it. And he was a man after God's own heart. And so you, we're expecting things to be different for us. Why? Even the years leading up to him going, you know, and fighting Goliath and all. If, if you remember, when he goes to his brother, his brother's like, what are you doing here? Yeah. I know what a naughty boy you are. You just came to check out the battle. and well, Who's taking care of those sheep? And, and if you read it, David's response is, what have I done this time? In other words, this is a normal occurrence. It reminds me of Joseph, right? The only one that seems to be righteous among all of them and the rest of them hate him. And David was experiencing the same thing at home before the situation with Saul and you know all the other things, the, the sin with Bathsheba that led to all the difficulty later on. His life was, was one of turmoil constantly. And yet he was an object of the love of God. That'll take care of those prosperity, that prosperity preaching you were talking about, Brother Jeff. You just need to read your Bible, That's it. right? That's it. You think you think that, that following the Lord just means life of prosperity and ease? Did you have you read your Bible? Verse. Uh, so all these things do the nations of the world seek after. Your Father knows that you have needed these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. I'm, I'm not trusting in my ability to gather these things for myself. I'm trusting in the God that provides these things according to our need, as the brother told us this morning. So don't uh, does worry help? The Lord says, listen, the smallest things, you can't add one cubit to your stature, he says in verse 25, by taking thought. That's our Greek word, worry. You can't worry enough to add one, one cubit to your stature. You can't add anything to yourself through worry and anxiety. And so if you can't do the smallest thing, he says in verse 26, why are you worrying about the rest of the stuff? That's our Greek word again, taking thought. Why are you anxious about the rest of these things? Be anxious for nothing. Our hope is in the Lord, so don't agonize, but trust Him to take care of you. 
So I don't want you to worry. And I also don't want Satan to condemn you for planning or preparing. Because these verses do not mean take no thought for anything. When it says, take no thought for the morrow in Matthew, it's the Greek word, don't worry. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Let me tell you something. If you want to eat lunch with me next week, we better start talking about it now. Okay? I mean, all our schedules, the way our lives are, if we're going to line that up and make that happen, we have, there has to be some preparation involved in that. Right? How many of you parents here, you know your kids have a test next week, Say, listen, honey, I don't want you thinking about that. <laughs> Take no thought, right? You just trust the Lord's going to give you the knowledge you need in that hour. He's going to fail that test. <laughs> right? You better prepare. You see, we do this without even thinking about it in other areas, but then we get to some decision and it's like, oh, I can't think, I'm not trusting God, I can't think ahead. Unless God says, don't think ahead, there's nothing wrong with it. And there are plenty of instances where there was preparation made. I, I, Lori, I remember Lori, we were, we were, I think we were engaged, we were at least dating, and, and I remember Lori being at the roller rink when she used to be a counselor at the Y down in South Georgia, and she said this girl, she fell, and, uh, and, and she messed her ankle up. I mean, she said you could tell with the swelling and the way it was displaced, she was in bad shape. And, and this friend of hers just goes down and she starts praying over it, you know, in the power of the Holy Ghost upon it. And she goes, all right, stand up and walk. And Lori's looking at it. She's like, this thing's still swollen and displaced. It's like, don't take any thought. Don't go to the doctors. Don't seek any help or any aid. Just trust God's going to take care of it. God often works through natural means. And sometimes it's, we're just being foolish and saying, well, I'm not going to prepare. Sometimes we're, it's an excuse for laziness. But we have to prepare in the right way. You know how I told you both of these things are right and sometimes neither of these things are right? So let's talk about the other side of that, right? Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Why didn't he say just trust God to heal you? Because God uses natural means. And sometimes he uses supernatural means. That's the other extreme, though. There's the other extreme where you have a person that may give lip service to God, but in practice he lives like everything depends on him. It's all about what I do. God helps those that help themselves, and so I've got to make sure I get those things. I have to do those things. Things he lives like it all depends on him. And you know what? We find such a person in a text that you may not expect me to go to. Go to Mark chapter 10. Brother Gary took us there this morning. And the person I want to, I'm going to pick out of here, again, it may not be the person that you expect. But in verse number 17... We have the guy that Brother Gary mentioned that we call the rich young ruler, right? He comes running up to Jesus. Why does he ask this question in verse 17? Why, why does he ask Jesus, what must I do to inherit? What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You know why he's asking that question? Because he knows something's amiss. Because his conscience is nagging at him and he knows something's wrong. But you know how he's lived his entire life? God helps those that help, himself, help themselves. His whole life has been focused on me doing this and me doing that. And he's checking his list off, right? I've done it. I've done it. And, and, and Jesus deals with him with that awareness in verse number 19. You know, uh, um, you know uh, the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness to fraud. Not honor thy father and mother. He said, hey, man, I've done that. I'm a doer. I'm, God helps those that help themselves. I'm a doer. But still something's not right. All these things I've observed from my youth, he says in verse 20, Jesus, beholding him, loved him. There's other accounts of this. This is the only one that says that. But I picked this one for that reason too, Brother Gary. Because the love of God is displayed as he tells this man the truth and he puts his finger right where the issue is. 
And he said, you're lacking one thing. This is what your problem is, young man. He doesn't say you're a fool for thinking that you've kept all these things perfectly. He doesn't even deal with that. And he is, right? If we've broken the commandment in one time, it says we're guilty of the whole thing. It's silly to think that he's kept all this from his youth. I mean, have you met a three-year-old? <laughs> Honor your father and mother. I've done this from my youth. <clears throat> one thing thou lackest. Here's the, here's the big issue. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And we know what happened. He went away grieved and sorrowful. Because Jesus just pointed out what the real issue was. It wasn't in his case that there, was a, that there was a lack of obeying, but there was a lack of trusting. See, you've got to trust and obey. There's plenty of obeying commandments in his life, but there was a lack of trusting God. And at the end of the day, the reason that he knew tomorrow was going to be okay was because he had a lot of money in his bank account. But now let's let go of that. Let's let that go and, and trust God and see where you stand. And, and so Jesus put His finger on His idol. He exposed the real problem. Let go of it and turn it all over to God. Sometimes the issue is you need to do. And that's more the emphasis because you're sitting back here and you're saying, well, I'm just trusting and you're not doing anything, right? Right? But other times you're doing all this stuff and your problem is you're not trusting. And that was his issue. He needed to let it go and turn it all over to God. He says in verse, listen to what Jesus says in verse 23. Jesus looked around about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? But then listen to what he also says in verse 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth them, answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Because there were rich people in the Bible that knew the Lord. But the issue was, do you have the riches or do the riches have you? Right? Right? I will tell you, <clears throat> for the most part, most people can't handle riches. Most people can. So get out of your head that the lottery, like our brother faithfully told us this morning, that that's going to solve your problems. Most of us can't handle it. And if you're God's child, you ain't going to get it. Because God says that's not what's best for you. Those that trust in riches, how hard it is for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's the context. Look at Luke 12. That's the context of what Luke 12 is presenting to us. We didn't read this, but if you read on down a little bit further, in Luke 12 and in verse number 32, he says, Fear not, little flock. I told you he was dealing with fear in this text, and he's also dealing with covetousness and the desire for worldly things. Fear not, little flock, for it is the father, your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Don't be anxious about those things. What you're going to eat, drink, put on. Don't be of a doubtful mind worried about that. Trust your Father's going to take care of you. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so is that a general command? And we need to say we all need to sell what we got and live in poverty. That's not what he means. But for some of us, that may be the need. Rich young ruler needed to sell everything that he had. But like I said, there were other men. There was a, there was a centurion. Remember the centurion whose servant was sick and the, the Jews came to them and they said, uh, uh, you know, this man, he's an honorable man. He, he built us a synagogue. That guy had to have some money to do that, right? This was a rich man. And this is the guy that Jesus said, okay, let's go. I'll go to his house. And the guy says, no, I, I got men under my command and I tell them what to do and they go and they do it. You just say the word, right? And my servant will be healed. And Jesus starts bragging on his faith. Here's a rich man and he didn't say, you know, this guy's got a big issue. He needs to sell everything that he's got first. And then we can... No, he says, here's an example of great faith. 
He could possess the riches and still maintain great faith. But it was working against faith as far as the rich young ruler was concerned because he was trusting in the riches and not the God of the riches. You see the difference? So this is the other extreme. Let me tell you something that you can't do. You cannot prepare for every possibility. I'm going to look away. No matter how much stuff you pack in that luggage, sometimes you're going to have something you don't need. Still not making eye contact with the party of interest. It's hard to do that, you know, when you're not supposed to look at somebody. You always... You're not going to pack everything you need, and sometimes you're going to, and, and many times you're going to pack way more than you do need, right? You, it's like I've got eight bags full of stuff, and I didn't bring a toothbrush, right? <laughs> That's the way it goes. You can't think of every possibility. There's one thing that that programming computers has taught me is you cannot think of every impossibility. There's always some sweet, nice person. I'm going to use that word that does the unexpected when they use your program, right? Never conceived of me that they would do that, right? <laughs> You can't think of all the possibilities, but God is the great programmer. He knows all the possibilities. He's accounted for all the possibilities. And when things take us by surprise, none of it took Him by surprise. He's not just accounted for the possibilities. He's working all things after the counsel of His own will, right? He's designed it to work this way. He's got a specific purpose. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, church to give you a, a future and a hope, to give you an expected end. I've got a plan for you in mind through all of this. You don't see that now. And maybe you're preparing, right? Maybe you're frantically preparing and you need to quit. Maybe that's sinful for you where you are right now. And you need to just let go like the rich young ruler needed to and just trust God. There's issues on both ends of the spectrum We've got to find our place somewhere in the middle and walk by faith, trusting and obeying. If you want crops, you'd better plant your field. Right? But you know what? Lori had a little herb garden and we walked out there one day and there's a watermelon in it. And the boys ate it and they said it was good. It was a little fella. Didn't get very big. But we didn't plant that. Not on purpose. Can God bring forth crops without you planting? Yes. But do you need to plant if you expect crops? Yes. And isn't there a spiritual lesson in that for us? We're planting and watering. That's what Paul said we're doing as we're declaring the Word of God. We better be planting and watering if we expect any increase. But we're also trusting that God's the one that's going to make that germinate and bring forth life, right? He's the life giver. So, yes, if you want crops, you better plant your field, but only God can make it grow. And unless you trust Him for that, you will not be able to live without anxiety like we talked about. You're not going to be able to live worry-free unless you trust Him. Right? I've done what I'm supposed to do. I've prepared. I've been diligent. I've, I've fretted not, like it says over there, and Lord, I'm, I'm trusting You. I'm, I'm obeying and just trusting for You for the results. Unless you trust Him to bring forth the increase, you're not going to be able to live worry-free. What if there's a battle? What if we see a battle coming? What if a nation sees a battle coming? Is that nation foolish to not train their troops? Yeah. If they see that there's a battle coming, you better train your troops and you better make sure that your, your gear, right, your machinery, that your weapons are all in good working order if you see that battle coming. But I want you to read Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. This is what the one that says, God helps those that help themselves... And what they really mean is, I'm going to do it all and give God lip service. This is what, this is a verse they need to focus on. Proverbs 21 and verse number 1, The horse is prepared against the day of battle. Preparation, right? You better prepare your horse. You better feed your horses if you know you got a battle coming. But safety is of 
the Lord. What's going to keep me is the Lord. It's not because I was so diligent in taking care of those things. My hope in victory, my hope in being protected is in the Lord. You see the difference there? You see that it's not without the preparation. It's not without the taking. It's not without thinking about tomorrow that the battle is coming, but it's trusting the Lord to take care of you in that hour. Let me give you a scriptural example, and this is really what, what prompted this entire lesson. 1 Samuel 17, all right? 1 Samuel 17. When Brother Ed went here Wednesday night, I was like, uh-oh. This is what I'm chewing on, Brother Ed. But he, he started right after this. Thank you, brother. 1 Samuel 17. He mentioned this, but didn't dig into it. And by the way, that thing I told you about David and his brother saying what he said, um, um, that's here in, in verse 17. And, uh, uh, oh, Eliab the oldest, verse 28, he says that, Why did you come down thither? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness. That's what he accused David of. While David's trusting in the Lord when he's keeping those sheep and, you know, writing psalms and, and, and God's taking care of the lion and the bear. And, and his brother says, you've you got a heart full of pride and you're naughty. And David says in verse 29, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Am I not here for a reason? And he's like, you know, and he turns to somebody else. By the way, we need to do that a lot of time. You know, whatever. Quit letting it bother us so much when people treat us that way and just say, you know, well, they treated Jesus this way. It's just the normal. Let me go over here and deal with this. Just let it roll off. you. It's like the duck's back, right? Water off a duck's back. That was just, that was extra. I wasn't planning to preach on that. But uh, you, maybe that'll help you out. All right, so ver listen to verse 34. In verse 34, now David, and David said unto Saul, and this is one scriptural example, and there are many about what we're talking about, about this attitude of, of taking no thought about, or about uh, preparation and planning, doing right, but also trusting the Lord. Listen to what David knew to be true in verse 34 through 37. David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David, there's a lot of eyes in that passage there. I'm a little bit concerned, buddy. Uh, you, you, you're trusting in yourselves? No. Yourself? No. What's the next verse say? David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me. The Lord that delivered me. Out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with you. There was a lot of doing and a lot of activity by David in those previous verses, but David understood that it was the Lord who had delivered him. There was no doubt in his mind that God gave him the victory then and that God would give him the victory now. Could, could you agree with me on that point? But notice verse 40. And so this is after he's tried ar Saul's armor on. You know, Saul's like, hey, prepare for battle. Here's the preparation. And he tries, he's like, you know, this doesn't fit right. This just, uh, the, the, I haven't proved this armor. I'm not, I'm not comfortable facing the enemy this way. And so he takes that off. And instead, in verse 40, he took his staff in his hand. This is something that he had used as he was a shepherd, right? He took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the book and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a... Can you believe it? I couldn't believe it when I read this. I mean, this was before I even went to the other passages. I was focused on this passage here. And then I got to looking at the, our main text that says, don't take any script. And we go over here and lo and behold, David's got a script. That is not just coincidence. And so I hope this will be tied to that passage in our minds in the future. He took his script. And his sling was in his hand. He's prepared, preparing to face the giant. He drew near to the Philistine. Did you notice that David did not take one smooth stone? He took five. Aren't you trusting God, David? 
you trusting that God can take that Philistine down with one stone? There, there's a little lack of faith here, buddy, right? Why would you take five? Don't you trust God? Did David's faith break down here? Uh, now, I've mentioned this to a few people here lately, and I've heard more than once that, well, Goliath had four brothers. <laughs> And maybe he did. I, I had a hard time seeing that for sure. Maybe he did, but I don't think it was common knowledge to David right here. I don't think that really fits in this narrative at all. You know why I think David took five smooth stones? Because David thought, I might miss him first time. Maybe I'm going to hit him the first time and I'm just going to wound him and I'm, not, I'm going to need a few others to, to complete the job, right? Or maybe I'm going to take him down and there's going to be a few foolish Philistines that come at me too and I'll take them out as well. You know what I think David's doing? I think David's just preparing for the unknown. He doesn't know exactly how many stones he's going to need. So he gathers five. And you say, yeah, but God only needed one stone. That's wrong. God needed no stones. <laughs> right? Yeah. Amen. God needed no stones to take Goliath down. Herod's up there exalting himself and he's eaten up of worms and dies. God could have killed Goliath like that, right? You remember when Israel's going into the, when they're, they're, they've gone into the promised land and God's reminding them of all that he did? I think I wrote that down. It's in Joshua 24. And he says, I sent hornets before you. There were enemies that were destroyed that you never even had to fight. God can do it supernaturally. He can do it naturally. He can do it however He wants because He's God. And David was trusting God. That much is clear. And yet he took five smooth stones. You better not condemn him for that. He's just preparing. We went hiking in Montana. It's the first time we'd ever hiked in grizzly country. And I would not have hiked in grizzly country except I was trusting the Lord to take care of us in grizzly country. I prayed that prayer. I prayed it more than once. <laughs> God protect us as we go on these trails. This is unfamiliar territory. You know what? Had bear spray strapped on my side. Had a 9mm strapped on my side. And I promise you there was more than one bullet in that magazine. Because I'm not trusting God? No. God can keep the bear away. God can send the bear after us. I can use my bear spray and he may or may not run away. And then I'm going to unload on him with that 9mm, right? But I'm not trusting in my ability to do any of that. I'm trusting in God to take care of us. I'm preparing because I don't know. Now if God had said, Jamie, and by the way, God never says that to me audibly, but sometimes you just know. And if God said, Jamie, I'm going to take care of you. You don't need to weigh yourself down with all that stuff. If the Lord had made that clear to me in however way He wanted to do that, then it, yeah, it would have been wrong for me to take that. But otherwise, I don't know. I'm just trusting Him, and so I'm going to prepare. Amen. That's what David did. Don't beat yourself up. Don't let the devil beat yourself up over that. Now, David wasn't like, let me, hang on. Uh, I need about 30 more. <laughs> you know, it wasn't. He didn't carry three extra suitcases, right? But uh, we've got a few extra in case we need them. It's okay. You know, sometimes the, the over, over preparation shows you that there's really an issue here. You know, there's something that needs to be examined. Are you really trusting the Lord in this or are you counting on yourself? David makes it clear, you know, we could read it, you're familiar with it, but when he goes to face the giant, you know, you come after me with sword and spear, he says in verse 45, I come to you in the name of the Lord. I don't come to you with five smooth stones. David wasn't trusting in that. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. And he says, God's going to deliver you into my hand this day in verse 46. In verse 47, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord doesn't save with sword and spear, because the battle is the Lord's. God doesn't need one stone. God needs no stones. Amen. And, if they, and, if, and if the giant had fallen down dead as David runs toward him before David did anything, it would have still been a victory and God got the glory because God did it with the stone and God could have done it without the stone, but the battle is the Lord's. Amen. He will give you into our hands. So prepare, plant, study, 
plan, but say, God willing. Yeah. Right? Yeah, brother, I'd love to meet you next week for lunch. I'll see you on Thursday, Lord willing. Make sure whatever it is that you're planning, you're preparing, fits within the confines of 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. Make sure your doing lines up with that, right? Trust in the God of all things. When He gives a clear command, obey His command. If He says don't take, then don't take. If He doesn't say, then prepare. If He says take, then take, right? That's what we do when we walk by faith. You just, I don't know what to do, so I just do what makes sense here, but I'm trusting that God's going to take care of me. And that David didn't even, there's, there's, no, there's no hesitation when David grabbed those five stones. He didn't stop and think, you know, let me think about this. Am I trusting God right now? He just did what made logical sense. But he is trusting God to take care of him in that circumstance. Take no thought for the journey. That was our... Or no. Take nothing for your journey. That was our title today. And I want, I want to tell you today, there is a journey that you need to be prepared for. There's a journey that every one of us are going to take and we're going to stand before God. Right? And we're going to give an account. And I want to encourage you that you have to be prepared in that hour. You, you may be that person this morning that's trusting in, you know, I got this thing, I'm taking care of this. I'm, maybe you're like the rich young ruler. I'm, I'm, I'm so good and obedient to these things and I'm doing all those things, but you know in your conscience that something's not right. What more is there? You've never actually trusted God, right? You might have been a Christian. I've been a Christian my whole life. It's too long. Yeah. Salvation's preceded by repentance from sin and acknowledgement of what I am and, and a confession of the Lord. When did that time, when did that break from that old nature happen, right? Where is that repentance? Repent. That's what they went forth preaching. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Can God save a child in the womb? John was filled with the Spirit of God from the mother's womb and he leapt when he heard Jesus' name. Don't get caught up in all that, right? God is able. But my point is this. My point is quit trusting in yourself because that journey's coming, right? That day is coming where every one of us are going to have, a, have to pass from this life into the next and we're going to face this God. And if you're facing this God on your own merit, you're on sinking sand. You have no foundation. You have nothing. You have nothing with all that doing with which to present that God in that hour. And you need to present Him something. He's going to take account of His servants. And there were three servants that had each been given according to their ability. And there was one servant that had nothing to deliver to his Lord. He had the talent. He had the original ability, um, just like I was at the start of this thing, but he had nothing further to give him. The other ones had more talents to bring back, right? But the one that had buried his talent, had buried his coin in the earth and had nothing to present to his master, he was the one that heard, depart from me. You were working iniquity. I never knew you. There's a foolish notion that some people have that you can walk in your own ability, that the Lord is out of the equation, that you're, you're, you've assured yourself if you try hard enough, if you work hard enough, if you, if you pursue it enough that you can attain that dream. But what if you don't? What then? Some people, when their dreams don't work out, they take their own lives. They can't handle it. You need to commit those things over to the Lord. You need to, you need to realize that, that those, those dreams are broken dreams and they won't ever bring the satisfaction that the enemies promised yourself. But you know what? There's another option here. There are people that trust in that. And what if you do get that dream? What if you do get all that it is that you wanted? What does it profit a man if he gained the whole world 
and loses his soul. What good will it serve you in that hour when you take that journey and you stand before that God? I want you to know before it's too late, I want you to hear that Jesus Christ said, you can do nothing without me. And when he said that in John 15, 5, you say, well, I've done plenty of things. Well, what, the context of what Jesus is presenting there, he's talking about branches being attached to a vine that are bringing forth fruit. You can't bring forth anything worthy without Him. We can produce sin all day long, right? But you can't produce anything that's pleasing to God apart from Him. There is no fruit. And every tree that is the Lord's produces fruit. He's going to see to that. One servant will hear, Depart from me, you were working iniquity, I never knew you. It's just the opposite of the servant uh, who, will, who labored and used wisely that which he had been given, right? He will hear in that hour, well done. Well done doing, right? Trust and do, trust and obey. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. What did he do? He was preparing for that day to meet his Lord, right? That's what you need to prepare for above all. He was prepared and he brought back more than what the Lord had initially given him. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. You need to be prepared for that journey. That's the journey that matters. That man, like David, prepared for the future and trusted his keeping to the Lord.